Remote Pilot Lesson Radio Communications. So we are going to go through the Remote Pilot Small Unmanned Aircraft System Study Guide. That is where the information for this lesson come from, comes from. That's what we're using for the basis of this information. We know you're a remote pilot and you're not going to be talking on the radio, but you do have to understand if you are in the vicinity of an airport, the language being used by the airplanes and helicopters or other aircraft. And we're going to point out uh, something in this one that you may or not have heard of yet. And I'm just looking at the book because I can never say this without hardly looking at it. We're going to um, be referring to ICAO in this in this presentation. And I, ICAO is International Civil Aviation Organization. Not that hard to say. It's just that we always call it ICAO. And I was worried if I didn't have the book open that I wouldn't be able to pronounce that. So we're going to get back to the presentation. So we're going to go through this and I'll jump in and give you a little, little bit of real world here and there. But we also want to hit what the FAA says you're going to have to know. Although small unmanned aircraft pilots are not expected to communicate over radio frequencies, it is important for the UA pilot to understand aviation language and the different conversations they will encounter if the UA pilot is using a radio to aid them in situational awareness when operating in the NAS, which is the National Airspace System. Although much of the information provided here is geared toward manned aircraft pilots, the UA pilot needs to understand the unique way information is exchanged. Understanding proper radio phraseology and procedures contributes to a pilot's ability to operate safely and efficiently in the airspace system. A review of the pilot controller glossary contained in the AIM, the Airman's Information Manual, assists a pilot in understanding standard radio terminology. The AIM also contains many examples of radio communications. ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, has adopted a phonetic alphabet that should be used in radio communications. When communicating with ATC, which is air traffic control, pilots should use this alphabet to identify their aircraft. So we're going to run through these for you so that you are familiar with them. A Alpha, B Bravo, C Charlie, D Delta, E Echo, F Foxtrot, G Golf, H Hotel, I India, J Juliet, K Kilo, L Lima, and Mike, N November, O Oscar, P Papa, Q Quebec, R Romeo, S Sierra, T Tango, U Uniform, V Victor, W Whiskey, X X Ray, Y Yankee, and Z Zulu. So next we're going to talk about airports without operating control towers. And occasionally during this, this presentation, I'll talk about the airport where we operate here, which is called the Plymouth Municipal Airport. It is an uncontrolled airport in the Class G environment. An airport may have a full or part-time tower service station called an FSS, which stands for Fly Service Station, located on the airport. A full or part-time universal communications Unicom station or no aeronautical station at all. So for our example here, we're a Class G, we do not have a control tower, we don't have a flight service station, all we have is what we call a Unicom. And it's 122.8 here at Plymouth, which is very common, you'll find that many airports are 122.8, 122.9, and here at this Class G uncontrolled airport, we just use what they call self-announced procedures. So when we're out there flying, we're just making uh, basically self-announced statements so that Anybody else that's in the area knows what we're doing, and we call it different times around the pattern, leaving the uh, pattern at the airport, coming back into the airport. So this FSS flight service station, you're not going to find those at a lot of airports. That's not going to be real common. Like here we have a Unicom. Now a lot of times when somebody's coming in in an airplane or helicopter, they might call the Unicom. Because it's a small, uncontrolled airport, where the airport's, airport is only occupied part-time, mainly Monday through Saturday from like 8 a.m. till uh, 6 p.m. during the week and then around noon on Saturday, there is somebody down in the lobby. So if you call in on the Unicom and you're asking a question, they will sometimes be there to respond to you, but they might be out mowing, they might be out to lunch. So it's not a dedicated um, service, but it's there, you know, just as an advisor, like if an airplane or helicopter's coming in, they might call the airport, let them know they're on their way in. And the guys downstairs will simply make a comment to them like what the uh, current runway in use is or what the wind is, things like that. 
There are three ways for pilots to communicate their intention and obtain airport traffic information when operating at an airport that does not have an operating tower, just like we do here, just as I've just mentioned. So airports without operating control towers, by communicating with a flight service station, a Unicom operator, or making self-announced broad broadcasts. So I just mentioned Unicom and mentioned self announce at the times when you'd have a, a flight service station at an airport, you could talk to them, but that's not going to be real common. Many airports are now providing completely automated weather, radio check capability, and airport advisory information on an automated Unicom system, which is what I just mentioned. Typically selectable by microphone clicks on the Unicom frequency. Availability of the automated Unicom will be published in the airport facility directory and approach charts. So to avoid any confusion here, the airport facility directory is also called is now called the chart supplement. So the little green book that we should have showed you in this course, if we haven't yet, I will make sure that, that we do. The airport facility directory, now called chart supplements, a little green book that gives you all the information about an airport. So again, you know, as time changes since they recently changed this name, if you see airport facility directory and anything that you're studying or looking at. It is the same as what is now called the chart supplement, the little green book that has all the information about any specific airport in it for your area, and those are for regions. So depending on where you're going to be operating your small and minute aircraft at in the country, you're going to need that book for that certain area. The key to communications at an airport without an operating control tower is selection of the correct common frequency. The acronym CTAF which stands for Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, is synonymous with this program. So again, you're going to hear people say CTAF, or you're going to see that abbreviated. That's what it stands for, Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, not a control tower frequency. This is just for traffic going in and out of a small, untowered airport. A CTAF is a frequency designated for the purpose of carrying out airport advisory practices while operating to or from an airport without an operating control tower. The CTAF may be a Unicom, Multicom, Flight Service Station, or Tower Frequency and is identified in appropriate aeronautical publications. So in this case, a tower may be open during the day and they close at night and that frequency that's the tower frequency in the day turns to a CTAF at night. So again, once the tower closes and the controllers go home, the local people flying in know to just use the tower frequency as the CTAF, where they're doing their self-announced procedures. A multicom frequency of 122.9 will be used at an airport that is non-towered and does not have an FSS or a Unicom. Although a remote pilot in command is not required to communicate with manned aircraft, when in the vicinity of a non-towered airport, safety in the national airspace system requires that remote pilots are familiar with traffic patterns radio procedures, and radio phraseology. When a remote pilot plans to operate close to a non-towered airport, the first step in radio procedures is to identify the appropriate frequencies, which we mentioned you can find those in the chart supplement. Most non-towered airports will have a Unicom frequency, which is usually 122.8, just like us here at the Plymouth Municipal Airport. However, you should always check the chart supplements U.S or sectional chart for the correct frequency. This frequency can vary when there are a large number of non-towered airports in the area. Now this should make sense to you in the fact that if you have a bunch of small airports right in the general vicinity of one specific area, if they're all on 122.8, it's gonna to get too crazy and too noisy, too many people talking. So the ones that are scattered out around the country, not real close to each other, usually 122.8. But if you're near a bigger city, where you have a lot, uh, a larger number of small airports together, which is usually what happens, they're going to break those frequencies up so they could be different. For non-towered airports that do not have a Unicom or any other frequency listed, the Multicom frequency of 122.9 will be used. These frequencies can be found on a sectional chart by the airport or in the chart supplement publication from the FAA. When a manned aircraft is inbound to a non-towered airport, the standard operating practice is for the pilot to broadcast in the blind when 10 miles from the airport. So broadcast in the blind just means this person's coming in, they want to make a radio call 10 miles out, 
They don't have any real weather. They haven't talked to anybody at that airport. There's no control tower. So broadcasting the blind just means they're making a radio call without knowing what's really for sure going on at that airport. The initial radio call will also include the position of the aircraft in its relation to north, south, east, or west from the airport. Here's an example for you. Town and Country Traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot is 10 miles south, inbound and landing for Town and Country Traffic. So when you hear that, they're just making you say it at the beginning and they're making you say it at the end so that it's very easy when there's a lot of traffic going on to hear only part of a radio call. So if you only make the call at the beginning of where you are, maybe the other person misses what you said at the end. So proper procedures for a pilot to call and name the airport at the beginning of their transmission and at the end of their transmission, and they should do that every single time. When a manned aircraft is broadcasting at a non-towered airport, the aircraft should use the name of the airport intended landing at the beginning of the broadcast and again at the broadcast, which is what I just mentioned to you. The reason for stating the name twice is to allow others who are on the frequency to confirm where the aircraft is going. The next broadcast that the manned aircraft should make is Town and Country Traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot is entering the pattern, midfield left downwind for runway 18, Town and Country Traffic. The aircraft is now entering the traffic pattern. In this example, the aircraft is making a standard 45 degree entry to the downwind leg of the pattern for runway 18. Or the aircraft could land straight in without entering the typical rectangular traffic pattern. Usually aircraft that are executing an instrument approach will use this method. So that means somebody's coming in flying just by their instruments and not what we call VFR. VFR is visual flight rules. IFR is instrument flight rules, and that's where someone would be doing an instrument approach where they're just on their instruments and flying a direct path right into the airport. Someone on a VFR flight is just going to be looking, and they're going to come in and usually do that downwind, base, and final into the airport. Examples of a radio broadcast from an aircraft that are using this technique are for an aircraft that's executing an instrument approach, Town and Country Traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot, is one mile north of the airport, GPS runway 18, full stop landing, town and country traffic. As the aircraft flies the pattern for a landing, the following radio broadcast should be made. Town and country traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot, left base, runway 18, town and country traffic. Town and country traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot, final, runway 18, town and country traffic. So I'll give you an example of those, and we're just going to use the helicopter as an example. But we'll say that this area right here is our landing spot in the runway. Runway is going this way. If they're on an instrument approach, they're going to be coming in. They're going to say something like GPS, ILS approach, something along that lines. So we're going to come straight into the runway. If they're VFR and they're flying just by visual flight rules, they're going to do a downwind, a base, and then final into the runway. So they're going to make a call usually on downwind. They're going to make a call when they're coming in to intercept that downwind. And they're probably going to make a call on base and then make a call on final into their into the runway. So again, that's the difference in the radio calls you'd hear between IFR and VFR traffic. After the aircraft has landed and is clear of the runway, the following broadcast should be made. Town and Country Traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot, is clear of runway 18, taxing to park town and country traffic. When an aircraft is departing a non-towered airport, the same procedures apply. For example, when the aircraft is ready for takeoff, the aircraft should make the following broadcast. Town and country traffic, Cessna 123 Bravo Foxtrot, departing runway 18, town and country traffic. A remote pilot must always scan the area where they are operating a small unmanned aircraft. This is especially important around an airport. So again, you really have to use caution when you are in the vicinity of an airport because you're going to have more traffic than you are just kind of out in the boonies. So when you're near an airport, you really have to listen up and pay attention because again, you know, the, the idea of the whole safety thing and staying out of trouble and not causing any danger to another aircraft is huge. It's, it's big. So, you know, I just recently saw a video where a, a drone was coming at a helicopter. And the helicopter's flying along at, of course, you know, pretty good, not, uh, 
pretty good clip, like 100 knots, 120 knots. Drone might have been going 30 or 40 knots. But that drone, that small unmanned aircraft, is so small that the pilot in the helicopter doesn't see it till it's almost on top of them. I mean, it just comes like out of nowhere. So it is your duty as the remote pilot to really take the time to understand all these things that we're trying to teach you in this course and making sure that you stay safe. While it's good operating procedures for manned aircraft to make radio broadcast in the vicinity of non-towered airport, by regulation, it is not mandatory. So that's one thing that we talk a lot about in, in our training and the helicopter training is, you know, we encourage students to make those radio calls, but they don't have to. And at any given time at any airport, that's a small uncontrolled airport, you could have helicopters that aren't using a radio. Same thing with airplanes, especially if it's older airplanes, there are airplanes out there flying that don't even have radios. So they don't have a radio, they're not gonna be communicating. So you're operating near an airport and you're listening and you're saying, oh, well, there's, there's nothing going on. There's nobody around. There could very well be aircraft that are coming and going that are not talking on the radio. So because you don't hear them, you've done the right thing, you've toned in, turned in, toned, tuned in the local frequency for that airport, just because you don't hear anybody talking does not mean that there are not aircraft there flying the pattern, taking off or landing. So you have to be very, very careful. For this reason, a remote pilot must always look for other aircraft in the area and use a radio for an extra layer of situational awareness. When operating the vicinity of any airport, either towered or non-towered, it is important for a remote pilot to understand radio communications of manned aircraft in the area. Although 14 CFR Part 107 only requires the remote pilot to receive authorization to operate in certain airport areas, it can be a good operating practice to have a radio that will allow the remote pilot to monitor the appropriate frequencies in the area. The remote pilot should refrain from transmitting over any active aviation frequency unless there is an emergency situation. Aviation has unique communication procedures that will be foreign to a remote pilot who has not been exposed to the aviation language previously. One of those is aircraft call signs. All aircraft that are registered in the United States will have a unique registration number or an N number. For example, November 123 Alpha Bravo, which would be pronounced in aviation terms by use of the phonetic alphabet as November 123 Alpha Bravo, in most cases, November will be replaced with either the aircraft manufacturer's name, make, and in some cases, the type of aircraft model. So what we teach, our first call of the day, we use like helicopter, November, 213, Bravo Lima. And then each call after, we'll say helicopter, 3, Bravo Lima. So we'll not use the November, the second, third, fourth call while we're in that flight traffic or that pattern at the airport. So keep in mind, it's very common for aircraft to sometimes abbreviate. Usually, when the aircraft is a light general aviation aircraft, GA, the manufacturer's name will be used. In this case, if November 123 Alpha Bravo is a Cessna 172, the call sign would be Cessna 123 Alpha Bravo. If the aircraft is a heavier GA aircraft, such as a turboprop or turbojet, the aircraft's model will be used in the call sign. If November 123 Alpha Bravo is a Cessna Citation, the call sign would be stated as Citation 123 Alpha Bravo. Typically, airliners will use the name of their companies and their flight number in their call signs. For example, Southwest Airlines Flight 711 would be said as Southwest 711. There are a few airlines, such as British Airways, who will not use the company name in their call sign. For example, British Airways uses Speedbird. A remote pilot is not expected to communicate with other aircraft in the vicinity of an airport and should not do so unless there is an emergency situation. However, in the interest of safety in the national airspace system, it is important that a remote pilot understands the aviation language and the types of aircraft that can be operating in the same area as a small unmanned aircraft. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of kind of how things work as far as the radio is concerned. If you have any questions at all, put them down below. We can always make additional videos to answer your questions. 
We do live training every week with our helicopter ground school. We'll probably incorporate some of those uh, to include some of the unmanned uh, aerial systems, may move that to its own date at a future point in time. But do you have any questions, something we stated doesn't make sense, put it in the comments below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Chief Pilot Gary Cleveland answers every morning, Monday through Friday. His first job is to log into the comments section and see if there's anybody we need to respond to inside the site. So have any questions, put them down below and we'll see you in the next video.